My name is Yanni Koskinas. I'm a senior fellow here at New America. And uh, I've been focusing on Afghanistan for quite some time. And it's a distinct honor and pleasure, sure, to, to, to welcome uh, Ambassador Hamdullah Mohib. He's the uh, Afghan ambassador to the United States. And today is a special day. Happy New Year to you, sir. Thank you. Happy New Year. Uh, and uh, just a brief introduction to him. Um, I think most, most people here uh, have probably uh, been introduced to the ambassador at one point or another. But he was the uh, deputy chief of staff to His Excellency the President of Afghanistan before his posting in 2015. Uh, a lot of people may not know, however, that uh, uh, Ambassador Mohib was born outside of uh, Jalalabad in the heart of uh, the jihad uh, back against the, the, the Russians. And uh, as a refugee, left at one point, uh, achieved his uh, undergraduate degree in London, and then later his uh, PhD. Uh, and so he's not only uh, a diplomat, but also an accomplished scholar. And uh, again, honor to have you here. Um, before we get started on the questions, just to give you a couple of administrative notes. Uh, first of all, if you can please use your telephone to text a, uh, at the future of war 2017, no space, to number 22333. Uh, if you've already done it, you don't need to do it again. But the question that we're going to put up here, uh, it's a poll question. Will the Trump administration deploy a significant number of new troops to Afghanistan in 2017? And obviously, A, if you think it's yes, and no, if you do not. And we'll see how it, it starts panning out. We'll give it a little bit of time. And uh, it looks right now off the top that this, this distinguished August group thinks no, and you're wrong. No, just kidding. Right. <laughs> anyway, let's get started. My, my game plan tonight, uh, to, today, is to, to give you uh, a couple of questions to get us started, because we have a very short amount of time with His Excellency. But I really want to get um, some uh, questions from the floor. So we'll go one question quickly to, to His Excellency, and then we'll go to the floor, and then I'll, I'll keep asking some in between. So. Without further ado, um, obviously this is a conference on the future of war. Uh, we've talked about earlier about how protracted uh, conflicts, even His Excellency the Ambassador of Colombia was here, he talked a little bit about the conflict in that country. These are complex, stubborn insur insurgencies that take a long time, and, but there is some end in sight for most of them. But there is a, uh, it just takes a long time. So my first question to you, sir, uh, as somebody who has uh, been affected by war, who has seen it uh, up close with you and your family, um, where do you see the future of war in Afghanistan? And, and we'll start from there. Well, thank you very much. It's an it's, it's honor to be here amongst uh, so many experts, and especially on such an important topic. My entire life has been spent in a war. I grew up in a war, and it continues to, um, uh, to dominate our, our discussion in our country. And so we think a lot about it. Um, and, and we think that while there is a lot of predictions about what a future world war may look like, um, if we don't end uh, the uh, state-sponsored terrorism, that is what the future world war would look like. Mm. Um, the rules of the game have been thrown out of the window. Uh, the United Nations built after World War II to be able to bring uh, some kind of consensus where states agree on a rule of the game, um, their, their cooperation, that has, all, that has gone out of the window. And, and whether it's the prisoners of war or, or any, any kind of rules that we had established when it comes to state sponsor terrorism doesn't exist. Uh, you can target a mosque too, or you can target a school, children, um, uh, you, you can hang prisoners, chop their heads off. None of that is uh, off the table. And that is why I think if we let this war be won by one state for its own foreign policy, you will start to, um, to get other countries encouraged to start using it for their own uh, reasons, uh, for, for, their, for their foreign policy gains. And that will be very difficult to end. 
Um, and that's a really d um, uh, dangerous world to look out to. But we see it going in that direction. We already see other countries, in addition to Pakistan, who started in Afghanistan, are, are already using state sponsor of terrorism in other countries. And, and while it costs a very small amount of resources mm. to start uh, an insurgency in another country, it takes a tremendous amount to fight it, as we, have know, as we know in Afghanistan. So uh, my plea here to the future of the war uh, would be to, um, to, to do anything we can to be able to bring back the old consensus. Mm. And that was states dealing with states directly without um, uh, sponsoring elements, non-government elements for their foreign policy influence over other countries. Uh, just to, to follow that stream for a second, obviously we saw that there are other people that doubt perhaps that there's going to be a uh, plus up of troops in, in Afghanistan soon, but certainly the discussion is underway. Mm -hmm. The debate is happening right now in terms of uh, policy, whether we're going to increase the, um, the, the number of troops. Um, but President Trump is a businessman, mm -hmm. okay? He, he, he has put... Uh, senior executives, some generals, but also a lot of CEOs and former businessmen. So there is that sort of mentality of return on investment. And how do we transl translate that return into, of investment where we actually make that value proposition to him to say Afghanistan is still worth this enormous um, investment that continues to go in there? Uh, I, I know that we've discussed this in previous, uh, you know, forums, but but for the for the benefit here, uh, what about that return on investment? What would you tell him? And I'm sure you probably have told him. But well, there are two ways to look at this. One is the literal uh, return on investment, in, and that would be in in business sense, uh, economic sense. The other is you are getting a return on investment. What you take for granted is what we want in Afghanistan, what people at war want. And, and I'll only give you two examples. The ability to be able to plan one's children's future, to save for their education, is not a luxury we have in Afghanistan and in any countries that go to war. Your return on investment is that you have that luxury. Yeah. And, and if you fail at this, what I, um, what I can guarantee here is that our present is going to be your future. And that is the return on investment. Do not underestimate this war and what it's doing, not just to Afghanistan, to the region, but to the world. And, and while it's easy to scan people, you can put as many scanners as you want um, on airports and any kind of travel restrictions. You can scan metal. You cannot scan people's brains for ideology. And, and if one insurgent ideological group wins, it's very easy for other ideological groups to, um, to, um, to, to be emboldened and begin that process elsewhere. It doesn't have to be the same ideology. Now, if we connect and look at these ideological groups, or at least the, uh, these terrorist groups that are fighting in different regions, their source and their ideology is pretty much the same. It may have different contexts, but it, it stems from the same thing. And, and the, the fact that its success in Afghanistan would mean all the other insurgents suddenly get the hope that, um, that they will also be able to win. And it doesn't have to be in that context. It is a return on investment that America continues to be safe. Yeah. And I, and I think it's, it's fairly fair to assume that, uh, uh, or actually make it clear that we're dealing with a return on investment uh, that's disproportional. I mean, we're investing some, but Afghanistan is investing everything. Uh, on, on this. I mean, well, last year we had 10,000 Afghans killed. 25% of them were um, civilians. By contrast, right, America lost close to 50,000 people in Vietnam War, in the entire war. We're making a huge sacrifice on absolutely. behalf of the world, and we know what its cost is to us, but uh, America should know what its cost is on the, the cost that we pay on your behalf, too. No, absolutely, absolutely. In blood. Uh, I, I, I live it. I, I witness it, unfortunately, uh, live uh, with uh, the recent 
uh, abysmally uh, uh, just atrocious attack that we had against the hospital uh, not two weeks ago. Why don't we take some, uh, some questions from the audience, if, if anybody has some questions, and then I'll continue uh, with, with some more questions to, to the ambassador. Um, okay. I why answered I, all the questions. Yeah, why don't, why don't, why don't, I, give you, uh, why don't I give you uh, 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 another? Oh, here we go. We have somebody there. What, can we just oh, use that? Here the we mic? go. I'll use that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, Andrew Fallon. I'm from the Military Officers Association of America. One of the things that, uh, you know, recent news says that, uh, you know, China has been standing in the background. Uh, they've opened up uh, the new CPEC, China Pakistan Economic Corridor. What do you see, in, in given Pakistan's role in essentially in the insurgency or supporting the insurgents, uh, how do you see that playing out and the impact on uh, bringing the uh, conflict to closure in the Afghanistan? Uh, just to be clear, you were asking what China's role is in 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 prevent. Well. Oh, uh, I think China, uh, from our understanding, uh, uh, China realizes what a danger this, uh, this instability causes to its own future um, and is doing everything, or at least trying to, um, to end that and to convince Pakistan to, um, uh, to end their support for insurgency. In Afghanistan, I think there, CPEC is just one way to encourage that stability in the region, and that's that's our take. One one interesting thing about CPEC, and I was talking with some some colleagues recently. Uh, CPEC is uh, one of the top priorities in Pakistan right now. Mm. It seems like it's actually receiving. Uh, any sort of support that needs to come from the Pakistani government, the moment, the moment you use the acronym CPET, mm -hmm. you, you tend to receive it. Um, so if stability on the western side of Pakistan for CPEC's purposes is, is, uh, is, is accurate, last couple of years that has meant the bulldozing of some insurgents into, mm -hmm. into Afghanistan. So it could have a negative impact. How do you turn CPEC or access to the sea, which is basically that corridor, to your benefit in Afghanistan? Well, let me uh, answer two things. One, in your in your um, remarks, you mentioned that there is, there is a lot of demand for CPEC in Pakistan, and that's because Pakistan has, um, has been starved of resources by itself, by its own policy, and, and I doubt it will be able to sustain itself for the next, if it continues down this path in the next two years, and the Pakistani people have been the the victim of um, uh, of this vicious policy inside. So there is yes a big demand in Pakistan, and as a good neighbor, we would like to see stability in Pakistan. For that reason, anything that would also bring stability to the country, we would we would support. Mm -hmm. um, the other aspect here is that. Like I mentioned earlier, insurgencies are, are getting emboldened by the fact that there is continued um, uh, tolerance of, of Pakistan's support to Taliban and the safe heavens. It also has, has been a threat to, to China uh, through its own uh, ATIM, the, the threat that is to China. So for China, it's important, and it does take it seriously because it sees what it would do to, um, to their own security. Uh, um, we just hope that uh, our immediate neighbor to the, <laughs> to the, the east. west, to the east, realizes that too. Yeah. And and one any uh, another question right there. Go ahead, sir. Uh, just wait for the microphone. Lieutenant Colonel Leonard, of the United States Army. Uh, just a couple quick two related questions, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, from your point of view, what's the greatest obstacle to success or winning in Afghanistan right now, and what's the greatest future threat? that we are not paying enough attention to? Well, it's, it's a great question and one we have been grappled with on defining what winning looks like because much of the discourse in the United States has always been on troop numbers, which is a tactical uh, a detail. Mm. 
what we need to be discussing is what do we want to achieve and, and then what would be the responsibilities of the United States, of Afghanistan and other coalition partners uh, to achieve that, that goal or whatever that winning may, may be. To our end, the winning would be we don't want a war, but we have to for peace sake. We want peace in Afghanistan and for that, whatever gets us to, the, to that goal. Uh, the current plan uh, in place now um, uh, over the next four years that has been agreed with resolute support um, is, is what will take us there. It would require um, it, it, uh, support from the coalition troops, but in four years' time um, we will be able to have what we need to be able to continue the, um, uh, the, 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 con uh, the combat role on our own. And then um, the, the future threat, um, as we see, is these, these groups that are crim to, to reiterate what I earlier said, uh, was the, uh, the number of these terrorist groups are increasing. Now, there are 20 uh, that are recognized by the United States that operate in our region, but there are more than that that are not perhaps a direct threat to the United States, but these groups are actual criminals and they are expanding their criminal network. The uh, drug trade alone is worth over $120 billion a year. Now, the United States spent about $117 billion in the last 10 years in Afghanistan. Now, comparing that to the yearly income that the drug trade brings in that network that has been connected, that, that it's not just the insurgency itself, uh, not the insurgents. Um, it's, it's the arms traders, um, it's, it's what the intelligence agencies in other countries make out of um, to be able to initially, perhaps the initial plan was to sponsor or to su provide support to the insurgency, but now has become an ingrained part of it. Now, that is becoming a bigger threat to global security, this, this network of, um, uh, of call them smugglers, uh, human traffickers, but traffickers of a sort that, uh, uh, that is becoming wealthy enough um, to be able to challenge states, not just one state at a time. Uh, and we are very concerned about that network. What, one, one thing, because uh, we're coming up on, on, on our time to, to close, uh, let, me, let me actually dig a little deeper to the question, sir. Mm. Um, last time, President Obama actually uh, sent forces into Afghanistan, perhaps one of the obstacles was the fact that we telegraphed the withdrawal. Uh, right now we're sending, or at least we're hinting that we're gonna send some forces, and we've given some commitment for equipment going to Afghanistan over the next three, four years. Do you see obstacles in the approach? Is it going too slow? Is it going, uh, are we telegraphing certain things and, and are, you, are you hoping to not see necessarily a telegraphed uh, withdrawal at the end of that? I mean, what are some of the obstacles with the, the way that we're approaching this, not just what, you know, generically may be an obstacle? Well, I, what we need is benchmarks and not just one benchmark, which would be the withdrawal. What we need is the, a number of benchmarks that, that create um, the, the, uh, th that would lead to the success. So the benchmark could be the Afghan security forces having what it needs in mm -hmm. terms of air power, in terms of surveillance equipment and others that would be necessary for it to, um, to, to contain the war on their own. Uh, it would also be the trainings that are necessary for them to be able to do so. It will also be the economy, the Afghan economy being on uh, getting to a point where it would be able to pay, where Afghanistan would be able to pay for itself. Then, uh, if we have a number, a series of benchmarks, we will be able to evaluate um, the progress that we make easier than if the only benchmark was withdrawal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that that's a, a perfect way of ending it. It's actually an academic and a realistic uh, mm. uh, answer to, to, the, to the way forward. Um, we have to stop right there and give, it back, give the floor back to, uh, to New America, but thank you, sir, for, uh, for your comments. We really appreciate it. We can have a Thank you, Yanni, for having us.